How many know there's a lot of people that we come in contact with that struggle? How many know that Jesus, one of the reasons why Jesus came is because of the struggle that came into the earth because of sin? And what Jesus wants to be able to do is he wants to be able to break the power of sin that causes a lot of the suffering that we're experiencing in our lives. Amen? Amen. And so the work that Jesus does on this cross is an amazing, powerful work. And what if, what if, if we fully understood the work, we could help some people that Satan is trying to rob of their life? Come on, guys, John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he's wanting to do in everybody's life. And how many know that, that, that man, I'm so thankful for what doctors are able to do and for the wisdom that, that God's given to some of them. And, but how many know that there's, there's times that they're limited and they can only do so much and then there's something beyond what they can do? How many, just to show of hands, know someone that the doctors kind of gave up on? It's like, well, you know, we, we, we just can't really do anything more. For you. Just raise it high, man. Raise it high. Keep it up. Isn't that amazing? I mean, look around at the room, at the hands of where, where, where the doctors, they were able to help in other things. But we all, all, just about everybody knows somebody that they were going through something that was bigger than what doctors could do. And the Bible says that with men... Things are impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. And what if we could, as a church, what if we could introduce some people to Christ the healer so that the, that young boy doesn't have to lose his father and that little girl doesn't have to lose her mother to the things that man can't help with? Because it's just too big for them. And I'm here to tell you that there is nothing too big for our God. There's, not, there's, just, there's nothing too big for him. Amen. So, so, so I want to jump into a series here throughout the next month called Christ the Healer. And, and the first thing that I want to be able to do is I realize in our church, our church is a very diverse church. We have people coming from, from all different church backgrounds. We have some evangelicals that are here. We have some Baptists that are here. We have some ex-Catholics that are here. Amen. We got some Word of Faith folks that are in here. Hallelujah. We got some Pentecostal people in the house. Amen. In, in, in the building. I mean, we got all kinds of different churches church backgrounds represented right here in this body. And I think it's amazing that we have people from so many backgrounds that are so united together in purpose and thought and that genuinely love one another. Come on, this is how the church is supposed to be. Isn't that right? Yes. Amen. And I love the unity of it because, praise the Lord, if we ever get off where we're not reaching the lost, our Baptist friends remind us. And guess what? We're plugged back in as a church to go reach the lost for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and if we ever get to a place where we're not valuing the power of God, our Pentecostal friends come in and say, oh, no, all things are possible yeah. with the Lord. And they kind of they kind of get us back in faith that, wait, God is bigger than our situations and our problems. Amen. And and anytime we start living too unholy, some of the people that grew up in some of those churches, are, you know, it's holy. We know we got to be holy. Amen. And, and how many know it just balances us out yes. because God never actually meant for us to be divided. He meant for us to be united. So all of the strengths would fill in because that's the way the church was supposed to work. Amen. 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 But with that, every church background has a different view of healing. And so what I want to do is I want to show you the reason why every church background has a different view of healing. And then what I want us to be able to do is I, I just want to take you on a journey. I, I just want you to open up your heart to say, you know what, no matter what I learned about this, will I just, can I just humble myself to just see what the Bible says? Not what men say, just what the Bible says. Amen. And, 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 and you know what, God, if there's something that I need to see that I'm not seeing, will you show it to me? Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'll just humble myself, not, not, not even to me, not even to, to Pastor David. I'll just humble myself to your word. Amen. So here goes the issue with divine healing. In the Gospels, we see that divine healing is a big part of Jesus's ministry. 
Matter of fact, he's, he's not just preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins, but he is also preaching healing too. Everywhere that he goes, not only do people's sins get forgiven, but they also are getting healed as well. And blind eyes are opening and deaf ears are popping open and lame people are walking and the dead is being raised. Amen. Matter of fact, John the Baptist, when when, when he was getting confused about it, amen, he said, Lord, are you the one or should we look for someone else? Isn't that what Jesus says? He says the blind are seeing and and those that can't hear, they're they're hearing and the the, the dead are being raised. And like, how many more signs do you need, John? Yeah. And so we see this powerful thing taking place in the life of Jesus, and it's just undisputable. It's all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, amen, just confirmed again and again this ministry of Jesus, and part of that ministry was, of course, healing. Matter of fact, even the work of redemption, Jesus' blood gets poured out for the remission of our sins, but his body, by his stripes, we are, he, healing is provided to us because of his stripes. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, in the, in the book of Acts, this continues on. Some people say it's the, the Acts of the Apostles. No, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit working through the Apostles. Amen? Like, it wasn't just the Apostles. It, it was the Holy Spirit in them. And so all of a sudden, they get filled with the Holy Spirit, and they go out into the world. And just like Jesus, they're seeing blind eyes open, and they're seeing deaf ears pop open, and they're seeing lame people walking. Matter of fact, Peter at the gate called Beautiful walks in, and he says, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give unto you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Get up and walk. And this guy who was crippled from the time of his birth stands up to his feet and is completely healed by the power of God. And the Jews couldn't even dispute it. It was just absolutely amazing. This actually continues on. Matter of fact, even Constantine in some of his writings talk about the miracles of the church that he was able to see. Now, he said he didn't see some of the things like what he read about in the life of Jesus, but he was still seeing the church performing some amazing miracles that the power of God was flooding through the church all the way up till, till his time frame. Amen. Now, here goes the problem that takes place. Praise the Lord. The first, this is not in your notes. I just want you to see this. And in 323 AD, Constantine makes Christianity a state religion. This is where the downfall of Christianity occurs. And matter of fact, it's not too much longer, uh, just just about 150 years roughly longer, uh, uh, divine healing ends up getting lost, but not just divine healing, a lot of stuff ends up getting lost. Because the the world and the church plunges into the dark ages. And the reason it plunges into the dark ages is because of what Constantine does. All right? Up until this period of time, Christianity, you have to make a free will decision to become a Christian. It's not forced on anybody. You understand? It is a free will choice, which is, by the way, God's design. And here, this Roman emperor gets this idea that, you know what we're going to do? We're, we're going to make everybody become Christians because everybody should be a Christian. Well, that's a good heart, I guess, but, but, it, but it just wasn't done the way God would have, would have wanted it to be done because you can't force love. So in Constantine trying to force a state religion, his heart was that people would find Jesus, but, but his action did something very different. Instead of the world becoming more Christ-like, what happened is the world flooded into the church and the church started to look more like the world. Instead of the world finding Jesus, the church got inundated with the world. It took about 150 years until the church lost its light. Up until this period of time, let me tell you something. They were separate from the world. They were living different than the world was living. They were thinking different than the world thought. The world thought in limits and boundaries, but not the church. No, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All right, the limits and the boundaries were removed. I mean, everything was different until all of a sudden the world crept into the church. And the more the world crept into the church, the less the church started to shine. And the less it started to shine, it started to shine less because it began, 
instead of being separate, it got inundated and became more worldly. So what was starting out to be something that should have been a very positive, hey, listen, we're going to get everybody saved. Well, no, you can't force that. Can't force people to do that. Instead, it just corrupted the church. Now, when the church loses its light, the whole world gets thrown into darkness. Isn't that interesting? The dark ages occur because the world, for the first time, doesn't have the church shining as a light anymore. So I know we got all these Christians out there that like to say that they can have a relationship with Jesus apart from the church. But let me tell you something. That is something Satan wants for two reasons. Number one, he don't want you to be a part of the church because if you're not a part of the church, then the church is missing your gift. But, but also, if you're not a part of the church, you're not a part of that pack. And so what takes place is he's able to pick you off because he's not really that tough. He doesn't go after people that are in a pack. He goes after the people that are straying from the pack. And so he wants to get you to stray. And I know that, that, that in my generation, there's been a lot of people that have been hurt in church. But you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because the church is still the light of the world. It still is the hope of the world. And, and, and what would this world look like if we didn't have a church? If there was no church? Let me tell you what it would look like. It would look like the Dark Ages. And that wasn't a wonderful time in human history. So we need to have a renewed passion for God's church again, I believe. And this whole idea of, well, I, I can love God and not be a part of the church. We, we need to can that. That came from hell. That didn't come from the Lord. Yes, that's right. God is all about uniting his people together. He's never about keeping them isolated no. and alone. Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes. Yes. It didn't come from God. No, no. Matter of fact, God's word says that if you say you love me, the proof of it is in the way you love each other. That you can't even say that you love a God that you don't see if you're not loving the people that you can see. Amen? Amen. The proof is in the pudding. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's in, it's in the love that you're allowing me. Because here's the deal. If you love me, you're going to love what I love. Yes. Amen? Yeah. And, and so I love people. And so if you don't love people, my love's not in you if you're not loving the people that I love. If you're not caring for the people I care about. Are you hearing me? So what takes place next is this. In, in, in 1517, God begins this renewal of the church, starting here with Martin Luther's revelation. And so Martin Luther comes into this revelation that, oh my goodness, we have been missing it for a long time. For over a thousand years, we have been missing something. It is not about the do's and the don'ts of Christianity. It is about Jesus Christ. He's the one that saves us. He's the one that frees us. It's not about all this other stuff. It's about Jesus. Amen. Amen. And all of a sudden, the light starts being, it, the church starts to shine again. Amen. With the message of Jesus. Now, it's, it, it's interesting because when the church is shining again, this is the same time that the world comes out of the dark ages. The church, hold on, the world comes out of the dark ages when the church begins to shine again. Amen. Wow. How important are we? We're a whole lot more important. The church is a lot more important than what we give it credit for. Right. Now, it's not till, so, so God begins this work and every, every, man, every hundred years, he's just restoring another truth. He's just restoring another truth, a truth that was lost, by the way, through the dark ages. When the world got, when the church got worldly and lost its light, okay? And so now God starts to restore revelation after revelation to the church to restore it back to what it was before all this occurred. How many know, however, that there's a lot of denominations that are beginning because this is the start of the Protestant Reformation. So how many ever heard of a Lutheran church? Come on, somebody. Yeah, that's because of Martin Luther here that got this idea. Well, wait a minute. It ain't the do's and the don'ts that we've been thinking. We can't earn our way into, into heaven. It is about 
Jesus only in that revelation starts a denomination. Now, what's interesting is every denomination gets this revelation from God, and then they draw a line in the sand, and it's like, we've got all of uh, the Word of God. We know all of it now, and they get proud in their newfound knowledge that no one else has but them. And so God has to raise up yet another generation to restore another thing to the church. Are you listening to me? And then you know what that, you know, you know what that church does? They create their own self a new denomination. And it's birthed out of this great revelation that God was trying to restore. But once again, they drew the line in the sand as far as we're going to go. We got all the light. Amen. Look at what we know. And then all of a sudden, everybody else is wrong but us. <laughs> and then God restores something else to the church. And then guess what happens? Oh, my goodness. Holiness movement comes. We, and now we got holiness churches. And, we, right? and, and, so, and so God restores something else to the church. And every single time men gets involved... Are you listening to me? Yes, yes. We draw the line in the sand. We create another denomination. So we're creating division instead of let God just starting to restore each thing. Not realizing this, that the reason why God chose you is because of the way that he crafted you. And the reason why God chose these people is because of the way he crafted them. And if you would all work together, you would see the fullness of the ministry of Jesus. Amen. But when you're separated, you don't see his fullness the way that you should. So God never wanted us to create all these divisions and keep each other, you know, from each other. No, his goal was that we would come together in the strengths and the revelation that he was giving us. And then in it, we would have the fullness of what Jesus came to provide. Amen. Come on, you can give me a better amen, amen. than that right there. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so different denominations are never our enemy. They're our friends. We love them. We love what God has showed them. Amen. Amen. We just got to realize that each one of us has a different piece of the puzzle. And, and you get to see the beautiful picture of what Christ has done when the puzzle pieces come together. All right, so it's not until 1946 and throughout the 50s that God restores healing to the church through what we call the healing revivals. But up until this period of time, how many know there's a lot of denominations that have already been established before healing gets restored back to God's church? How many doctrines then do you think were created out of a dark age time frame because we just didn't understand. We didn't know. And, and so we're trying to do the best with the information that we have. And it seems like divine healing might have been done away when the apostles died. Because we're not seeing it anymore. Well, you know, you're not seeing it because of what Constantine did. They plunged us into a worldly church that lost its light. That's why you stopped seeing it. But now God's restoring the light back to the church and every generation from the from 19, I'm sorry, from 15, 17, it's like every generation, he's restoring a new truth. He's restoring a new truth. He's restoring a new truth. And then finally in 1950-ish, praise the Lord, healing gets restored. But each one of them, God's doing this amazing work. So how many know if you're dwelling with a limited understanding and you're living the best you can to the light that you currently have, it could feel like healing's done away, even though that's not actually what's happening. It's just that God is still restoring things to the church. Now, here's something that's really crazy for you to think about. How much has God restored to the church where the church could be a light again like it was in the beginning? And if that's the case, how close are we to the last days? Amen. Woo! Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. So uh, I wanted you to see that because, because each church has a lot of different beliefs about healing. But can you see where they would get all those different beliefs depending upon where they're at when healing is being restored? Amen. 
So one of the beliefs that we've always will end up running into as we look at different denominations, some of you guys grew up on your divine healing journey. Amen. That's kind of what I'm calling today's message is like, let's just go on a divine healing journey together. Amen. Let's, let's just start to understand some of this and let's just open up our heart to God and let's just say, God, you know what? I don't know where my church got whatever it got about this, but you know, some of our churches were launched way before healing revivals ever even happened. Healing wasn't even restored yet. And we had and we form doctrines around these things that were actually coming out of a time frame when the church got so worldly it lost its effectiveness. But God, you don't want us to be an ineffective worldly church. You've called us to be separate. You called us to be different. Amen. And so, and so well, one of the questions we got to ask is, is divine healing for today? Is divine healing for today? And, and we'll answer that throughout, throughout our time together. And you already know my answer. It is yes. Matter of fact, like I said, listen, guys, my wife, and some of you, you know, you've heard me tell the testimony again and again, right, right. my wife wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for divine healing. Amen. So, 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 so it's, it's amazing, and it's something that I think each one of us needs to have a better understanding of, even if you're not called you know, because some people are kind of bent that way. They're kind of called to healing. You know what I mean? Like it's the passion of their heart. You know, some of you guys, it, it, it's never going to be the passion of your heart because it's not what you're called to. But even if, even if you're not called to it, how many of you know it's a provision that God has for us and we would be wise to at least study it out a little bit because even if we're not called to it, we probably know someone who really could use this. And one day, honestly, maybe it might even be us. Amen? So like God just, if this is something Jesus is coming to give us, I don't understand it, but I'm willing to go on a journey to understand it. I am willing to open up my heart and open up the Bible and just see what the Bible says about it. I want to go on this journey, amen? The second thing is, uh, is divine healing for all, amen? Now, can you see, however, is divine healing for today? Can you see how some churches may say no? Because if they came out of the dark ages, it's not restored yet, it could seem that way, couldn't it? Couldn't it? Amen? So we got to understand it. We, gotta, we just got to understand that. So, see, it's not about us being right and them being wrong, that's why the church keeps missing it. We keep fighting each other over these different things. Well, the Bible, I had it, and I got my verses, and you got... No, we, just stop, stop fighting. Just quit. We're not called to do that. Let's understand each other a little bit. Let's listen to each other a little bit so that we can have a better understanding of what God is actually doing in the earth. And you might begin to find out that he's doing some really powerful things. Amen. And that healing... Although at one moment it may have seemed like it died, it's not dead. The healing revivals prove that. Amen? Because guess what happens in the healing revivals? It looks just like the, the, the book of Acts. Amen? Blind eyes are opening and deaf ears are being unstopped. Amen? And lame people are walking. And, and yeah, I mean, there's some powerful stuff happening. Once again, God is restoring it all back to the church so it can shine in the end times. Amen? So it's divine healing for all. That's normally the next step because once, because because there's several denominations, the church I grew up in being one of them, that stumbled into divine healing. In other words, praise the Lord, they got people healed by accident. <laughs> they prayed for somebody and they got healed. Like, whoa, this is crazy. It happened. So you know what the next progression always is for a church who starts the healing journey? The next progression always is, well, okay, God does heal, because once you see it, then you know he does. But he just doesn't heal everybody. And we, we just go there because we've seen, because uh, we've prayed for people and they haven't been healed. And so that's just, it's kind of like the natural conclusion. Okay, well, he does, but just not for everyone. Well, praise the Lord. No, let's not just create a conclusion based on experiences. Let's see what the Bible says about it. Let's look in the scripture and, 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 and really see what God's desire is. Because there might be another explanation for why some don't get healed when we pray. Maybe it's not just that God, didn't, that God wanted this one healed but didn't want this one healed. Maybe that's not the conclusion. If we look into the Bible, we might actually find a few other answers that might help us better understand the healing journey. Amen? 
And then finally, praise the Lord, or uh, next, you know, uh, does, does God put sickness on us to teach us? How many have been taught that one? God puts sickness on us to teach us. And, and so there's some denominations that, that they, 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 they believe that. And then there's other denominations that they say, oh, oh he does not, praise the Lord. Uh, we're one of them that says, uh-uh, no, no, he doesn't. And here's the reason for it. Let me show you why. Because here's what the Bible says in Acts 10, 38. It says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Christ the healer, with the Holy Ghost and with power. And Jesus went about doing good and healing. So how many know God considers healing to be what? Good. Only good things come from the Father of lights. Isn't that, isn't that what the Bible tells us? And there's no variation. There's no shadow of turning. He doesn't do something bad. He only ever does good. So, so God saw sickness to be bad, but healing to be good. So we know God's not the author of sickness. This verse actually tells us what it is, though. He healed all that were oppressed of the who? Yeah, so the devil was the one that was running around putting sickness on people. Jesus, God, was the one running around taking it off. Yeah, see, he was able to do it because God, the Father, was with him. Amen? So when you look at the Bible, then you have to say, well, wait a minute. God doesn't put sickness on me. Satan does that. It's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy so that's not God doing that to me. Instead, God is the one in the middle of a sickness. God is the one that wants to remove that from my life. He anointed Jesus for the purpose of healing all that were oppressed by the devil. So this is Satan's work. It's not God's. And let me submit to you that God does not need Satan's tools to teach his children. Let me submit to you that he has his own methods. Amen. Number one method, by the way, is the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you accept him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, the spirit of the living God moves in and he moves in for a single purpose, guys, to reveal truth to you, to teach you. What is Christ? Are you listening to me? He is our teacher. Sickness isn't our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. And he is a way better teacher than any sickness. Matter of fact, you can have sickness in your life and never learn your lesson. <laughs> Amen? Because it's the Holy Spirit that is the one that reveals and that shows and that begins to teach us. The second thing that God gave us is his word. His word is to teach us. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. We need to be workmanship, uh, workmen that are not ashamed, correctly dividing his word of truth. Amen. And so his word is something that he uses to teach us and to purify us. Sanctify me by your truth, God. Your word is truth. And the word and the spirit of God will always be in agreement. Amen. Amen? The third thing that God gave you to teach you is the fivefold ministry. He's called people to be pastors and evangelists and teachers. He's called people to come into your life to help teach you. So, so God's method isn't Satan's method. God's method is the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the men and women of God that He's placed in your life Amen. to show you the way to go. Amen. Now, will he, will he take something the devil uses for evil and turn it for your good? Yeah. Oh, he'll do that. So could you go through sickness and learn a lesson? Oh, yes, you could, especially if you're listening to the voice of the Holy Ghost. You're going to learn a lot of lessons. But it's not the sickness that taught you. It was the Spirit of God that taught you. Amen. My favorite response to somebody who says that God put sickness on me to teach me a lesson is, why don't you learn your lesson <laughs> so that you can be healed? I mean, how stubborn do you have to be? How prideful do you have to be that you've not yet surrendered and learned your lesson yet? See, it, we say things and we don't even think about what we're saying, do we? I would never tell off on myself like that. No, the truth is that's not what he is doing. He's not using the sickness to teach you. Matter of fact, sickness in of itself doesn't teach you to be better. It teaches you to be worse. 
Come on, man. I rarely get sick, but when I get sick, I normally have to repent afterwards because I normally say things that I would have never said when I was feeling good. Are you listening to me? Isn't it true? Your best side does not come out when you're not feeling good. So we know it ain't from the Lord. It's from the evil one because guess what? We become evil. You know what I'm saying? Like we become, we we don't have no patience, amen. And and we think about ourselves and and how we feel. And we're not thinking about, we're not putting others before ourselves. And it, it doesn't produce in us the things that God desires. But you know what does? When you're feeling good. It's amazing how all of a sudden you have all this more patience. You just, you're more loving when you feel good which is the reason why God wants you to feel good. He wants to make it easy on you, not hard on you. And then here goes, here goes the, uh, uh, you know, yet another one. This one's kind of interesting because this, this, this is one that's, that's been adapted into churches that believe in healing. And I got to tell you, it's hurt a lot of people. Amen. And so, and so we need to address it because this is another thing that, that, that messes people up in their journey of healing. And that is, how many, how many have ever heard this? Well, you just didn't get healed because you, know, you just didn't have enough faith. It was just your faith. You just don't have enough faith. If you just had more faith, then you could be healed. It's, it's, it's just your faith. You just, little wimpy faith. And, and how many know that doesn't make anybody feel good, does it? Right? Like, I, 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 man, I, I, need, I need you to touch me, God. Well, I'm sorry, but you just don't have enough faith. If you had more faith, then you get it. And no wonder the church has gotten turned off to healing because some of, the, some of the places that started to believe in it got filled with pride like every other denomination, drew their line in the sand, and they started to elevate their revelation and their self above people, which is not how God ever intended it to be. Is faith important in healing? Sure it is. But let me tell you something, what this statement didn't come from God. You know how I know it didn't come from God? Because it doesn't even agree with Scripture. Let me show you what the Bible says about it. Praise the Lord. In Romans 12, 3, it says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The measure. The measure. There's only one measure, by the way. See, it's the measure that comes from the Christ living inside you. And you didn't get a different Christ than I got. When, when you accepted Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, you got the same spirit of Christ that I got when I accepted Jesus into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. And when Jesus moved in, he didn't leave his faith in heaven. So, well, you know, what? I ain't taking no faith with me. No, no, no. He, he moved in and you got the measure of his faith. So you got a heart filled with faith. Faith ain't your problem. You can believe for the highest and the best the second you get saved. You have the faith in you that made the world. Are you hearing me? You have enough faith. That's not the issue. You say, well, pastor, what's the issue? I'll show it to you in just a moment. Amen. But I just want you to realize that we've heard a lot of things in the church. We've heard a lot of things that aren't necessarily accurate. Amen. Now, I grew up in a church that believed... They were actually evangelicals, so they believed that, uh, you know, uh, pretty much in, uh, where, where everything has ceased. So healing has ceased, and the gifts of the Spirit have ceased, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit has ceased. And, and, and now, now here's the thing, though, is that we had a pastor that was seeking the Lord, and we had some people in the church that were really, truly seeking the Lord as well. Well, the pastor's a really good guy. And in a prayer meeting, he ends up, uh, you know, now he's seeking the Holy Spirit, but, he, but, but nobody's laying hands on him. He, he breaks out into, into other tongues. I joke around. I say he got filled with the Holy Ghost by accident. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, like he's pressing in, in prayer, and all of a sudden, this beautiful language of heaven comes out. Now, you know, he was seeking the Lord. He was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So don't misunderstand me. But nobody lays hands on him. All of a sudden, just God does something in in him. Well, you know, that kind of helped change our church just a little bit because all of us knew him. And, and he's not a deceptive guy. He's not the type of, I mean, he's an honorable, like, he was a man of God. And so we looked at him and we said, there's no way it's the devil because he doesn't follow the devil. Do you know what I'm saying? 
I mean, he is a sincere follower of Jesus. Amen. And so we had to change what we believed about that. Well, it's not too much longer after he's filled with the Holy Spirit that we see in our church, he prays for somebody, anoints them with oil, <laughs> and, 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 and they get healed. Whoa. How many know that started to kind of launch my healing journey? Because here before, I didn't even think that it was something that, was, that could happen. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing something happen, and it's, it's just blown our mind. It's, it's causing us to have, to have to rethink what we've learned. We started, to believe, we started finding out that God is actually bigger than what we thought he was. Right. And that he wants to have a lot more access into our life than what sometimes we give him credit for. Right. So based on this scripture, this was the scripture that, 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 uh, that the pastor was following, praise the Lord. And James, he says, if anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, and, and so that's, that, that's what the pastor was doing. He was doing this verse. Now, I think that's very interesting because, because a denomination that didn't believe in healing was still doing this, which is interesting because why would you do it if you didn't believe in healing? If healing's truly died, why would we keep doing this? But, but, praise the Lord, all of a sudden, this is still happening. Now, once again, he's starting to see some things, so I don't want to mislead you, amen? I, I, I kind of make a joke from time to time, and I say, you know, he got somebody healed by accident. Well, you know, to a certain degree, yes, because it's the first time somebody got healed. But to another, to another degree, he is seeking these things. Amen? And so he's starting to believe. It's funny that when he didn't believe, he didn't see any of them, but when he started to believe, he started to see very interesting. Amen. When he opens up to a different world of possibilities, those possibilities start to flood in. And, and, and so, so it says that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. So, so the purpose of anointing them with oil is for the purpose of God making them well. Right. So God wants them well. And so if somebody's sick, call so that you can be made well. Because I don't want you flipping out on your spouse and being all hateful of me while you're not feeling good. I want you well so that you're being nice. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it goes on to say this, praise the Lord, that, uh, that the Lord will actually raise them up. And if there has been sin, then they will be forgiven. And so here's what I want you to do. You know, it, man, go and confess your sins to each other and then pray for each other. Like get, get, get your junk under the blood of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And then pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So when you get your stuff under the blood of Jesus, it's amazing at what God can do in your life. Hallelujah. Like your prayers start making some power available. Dynamic and it's working. And so never underestimate what God will do. Amen? So, so this is what ends up taking place. And guess what? It starts me on a, on a journey. I, I, I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more. And, and one of the things that I discovered is that God actually wants every single one of us healed. Matter of fact, this is the way the Bible says it. He, he has this desire for us. 3 John 1, 2, it says, I desire. Now, remember, I realize that this is not God. This is, this is a person writing a letter saying their desire over a church, okay? I get that. Here's the problem with that. Who wrote it? It wasn't the man that penned it. It was, it was the inspiration of the Spirit of God behind the men that penned it, okay? So these aren't the words of men. This is the will. This is what God wants, okay? And so, and so God says, I desire that you, for you to prosper and to be in health. I want you healthy. I don't want you sick. So what does God want for you? He wants you to be healthy even as your soul prospers. So he says that there's this link, there's this connection between you being able to prosper and be healthy that has to do with, with something that's going on between your ears. Why did we stop seeing so many people get healed? Because we got too worldly and our beliefs, what was going on between our ears got dulled down. We're not seeing it the way that Jesus presented it to his disciples. Amen? Now, I wanted to understand this more and more because, because I had a cousin, um, and we prayed for him, because we were just learning about all this stuff. And so we prayed for him, and he had cancer. 
and he died of cancer in his early 20s. And, and, and that kind of did something in me because, you know, a part of me wanted to just abandon healing and say, oh, you know, bah, because it, was hurt. I mean, it hurt. Like, it hurt. You know what I'm saying? So, and then there's this other part of me that says, but I saw someone else get healed. And so even though he didn't get healed and we prayed for him and he didn't get it, someone else got it. And if somebody else could get it, like, God, you're not a respecter of persons. You love all of us the same. Why did somebody else get it and he didn't get it? And I need to understand it. Like, I need you to help me. I need you to show me some things. And it sent me on a journey. Rather than running from healing, it caused me to actually run more towards the Bible to figure it out and say, God, what's going on with this? And I'm not telling you that I have every single answer. I'm just telling you that the journey that I've been on, there's been a lot of questions that have been answered. And I want you to just go on that journey so that some of the questions that you have can be answered. Because you know what? My cousin sent me on a journey, and yes, he, he, he died. But if it wasn't for the journey he sent me on, my wife would have never lived. Because she was supposed to die in her early 20s too. And the doctors have given up on her and said, there's nothing more we can do. And if you have kids, the strain on your heart, because she had issues, the strain on your heart, pfft, you'll die. And at that moment, she ran into this guy that's been on a healing journey, praise the Lord, and said, oh, no, wait a minute, you don't have to die. I already had a cousin that did that. Let's do something else with you. You in your early 20s, amen. Satan already stole one person from me. Let's see, uh-uh, we're we going to steal you from him. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's not going to take your life. No. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. And she started a healing journey, amen. And when she started to open up her heart to divine healing, it's amazing how all the symptoms of all that junk came off of her life. And let me tell you, she's, 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 she never had a heart transplant. Amen. She's, 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 a, she's a little bit older than 21 now. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we've got three beautiful children. And it's all because we said, you know what? God, I'm just going to open up my heart. Take me on this journey. Amen. So praise the Lord. So Hosea 4, 6 actually gives us a big, big clue. It says this. It says, my people are destroyed because I don't love them enough. No, that's not what it said. Hallelujah. That is so not what it said. That, no, that's not why. It, it, you, we don't get destroyed because God doesn't love us enough. He loved us so much he sent Jesus. Well, my people are destroyed for a lack of provision. I just didn't provide it. I just didn't provide what was needed for them. No. It's not a lack of provision. By his stripes, we are healed. Jesus provided everything that we would need for life and godliness. So not just for godliness, but for living in this life too. Amen. All right? Now, uh, my people are destroyed for uh, 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 a lack of power. No, that's not what it says. He has the power to heal you. He says, my people are getting destroyed because they just lack the knowledge of it. Well, what started some of that knowledge in our, in our situations? Could, could it be that the world got into the church and the light of the church dimmed out and the dark ages began? And now God is trying to renew and renew and renew and fan the flame of the light that's in the church so it can shine bright again like it did before? Like, could that be what's going on here? And God is trying to restore the knowledge to us, but when we don't have it, when we're lacking it. See, it's not that I didn't provide it. It's that I gave them all these great and precious promises, and it's through the promises that they are able to be partakers of the divine nature. But here's the problem. Some of my church, doesn't, they don't know the promises. And they're getting destroyed, not because I don't have them. They, just don't, they don't even know them. And the other ones, the other, others of them, they, they know the promises. They just don't know how to access them. And so there's all this confusion 
got one denomination telling them one thing and another denomination telling them another thing and another belief in the church says this and then this guy says this and, and there's just so much misinformation out there and we're being destroyed not because God doesn't love us, not because he hasn't made provision, not because we don't have the promises, not because he doesn't have the power. We're just getting destroyed because we are messed up in the way we're seeing it all because we're having because God's having to restore it to us. He's having to restore it to us. And some of us have more hurdles to overcome than others. Because some of us grew up in some churches that gave us some pretty big hurdles in some of these areas. And so we've got to humble ourselves and say, wait a minute, you know what? I don't care what any person has taught me. Lord, what does your word teach me? Because that's what I'm going to go with. People can be wrong, but your word is always right. Amen? Amen? And the more we do it, the more we come out of a lack of knowledge and the more we begin to understand and the more we understand, the more we see. Amen. So here goes this Barna research. I thought this, that this was pretty, pretty impressive. Praise the Lord. Three years ago, 2006, they did this, this article. It's uh, on the bottom of your notes there. It's called uh, Most Americans Believe in Supernatural Healing. Amen. It was on Barna.com, September 29 of 2016. Amen. So they just started to poll uh, uh, just Americans. Amen. The church, other religions, atheists, the lost. They just started polling people like, America, what do you think about all this? Now, this is after the healing revivals. Isn't that true? After God started to restore some healing to the church. Isn't it true? Amen. So Barna starts to do this, this, this study, and here's what they discovered in their study. That out of church people, this is practicing Christians. Amen. Now, the word practicing Christians, let me define it for you, because it doesn't mean what it meant when I was growing up. A practicing Christian is a Christian who is reading their Bible, praying, and has gone to church. They go to church at least once a month. Now, when I was growing up, we would call you backslidden. Yeah. Amen? Because like, <laughs> we went to church every Sunday. You know what I'm saying? If you didn't go every week, you know what I mean? If you were only going once a month, you, you, were just, you were playing a game back then. You know what I'm saying? Now, today, that is now considered a practicing Christian. How many know uh, maybe we should change that? Because that's probably... Yeah, amen. But, but, but out of practicing Christians, and people that just come to church one time out of, out of an entire month, and they read their Bible and they pray. They asked them, they said, how many of you have experienced a miraculous healing? Now, when they said miraculous healing, amen, this, this, this was what they actually said uh, in the article. Uh, this was not a healing through normal process. This is not a healing through medical procedure. This is not a healing through the body healing itself. All right, so this has to be a bona fide, God did something miracle, okay? Can't be explained. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't from men. This was God intervening into the affair of my life, and only he could do this Amen. type of healing. Now, even with all of the misinformation in the church, even with all of the different beliefs that we have in the church, 51% of practicing Christians, this is just Christians that they go to church once a month, they read their Bible, they pray, and they are seeking the Lord. Amen? So 51% have experienced a miraculous healing within their lifetime. Now, maybe they didn't get healed every single time they prayed, but in their life, 51% have experienced a miraculous healing in their lifetime of practicing Christians. That's pretty amazing to me. How can you say healing's not for today when over half the church, even with all of the misunderstandings we have, have experienced God stepping into the situation of their life and doing what men couldn't do? So I want to just take a poll in our church, praise the Lord. If you are in our church, praise the Lord, and you have, now this is not through natural process, this is not through, you know, a medical, uh, you know, uh, surgery or whatever, you know, that, like this is some, just a bona fide, God, somebody prayed for me and God just like changed it, amen, like it was God, God did this. If you've experienced a miraculous healing in your lifetime, would you just stand up to your feet? I just want to see who, who in our church has experienced a miraculous healing within the their lifetime. Wow. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? 
So do you need to take my word for it? No, why? We, look, we even got guys in the back standing up, amen? Yeah, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, so, so do you need to take my word for it? Is God still healing today? Yes. Listen, you don't need to take my word for it. After church, if you're, if, you're, if you're questioning that, go talk to somebody who's standing up. Talk to a couple of them. What did God do for you? How did this happen? Amen. All right, you can be seated. Can you give those a just a round of applause? Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, check this out. Of other faiths, this is what we've got. We've got 14% of other faiths that have experienced God's healing power. 14%. That's a big drop. That's a big drop. Why, why did it drop so much? Because Christ is the healer. Come on, 51% of those that are following Christ have experienced that. Amen. Craig, what's the percentage of our church? Do you know? All right, well, let me know when you know. 51% of, 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 of practicing Christians within the church have experienced this. And in the world, in other religions, where they don't honor Christ as the healer, 14% said that they've experienced it. Now, why? I believe because the goodness of God draws us to repentance. So praise the Lord. So healing is the children's bread. Isn't it true? But God will still use healing to try to reach the lost, won't he? Look at that children's bread right there. And here he's trying to reach the lost. Yep. 43%. 43% just within our own church. Now, let me tell you something. By the end of this month, we're going to change those percentages, baby. You know what I'm saying? And just, all, you, all I'm asking you to do is just go on a healing journey. Just open up your heart. And I'm telling you, we'll change those percentages by the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's, let's boost over 50% church. Amen. 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 Check this out. 10% of atheists, I just thought this was hilarious. Amen. 10% of atheists say that they've experienced God healing them. <laughs> and they call us uneducated <laughs> or crazy or whatever you want to call us, right? Like you're so educated that you've experienced God healing you, but you don't believe in God. That's very interesting. And what do we see? Once again, it's just God, his goodness. He's trying to get into people's lives. He's trying, he's trying to show them who he is. He's just trying, he's trying to reach them. He's trying to reach them. Now, this gives us something, though, because here, here's 10% of people that don't even believe in God. They say, no, nah, I'm, like, I'm even against him. And here God's trying to, he's trying to win them. He's trying to reach them. He, you got people that are, that are coming to God, but they're coming the wrong way. And since they're not coming through Christ, they're still seeking, and God's still trying to get into their life. So their percentage goes up just a little bit more. But to those who have surrendered their life to Jesus, over 51% have experienced it. And so this is what, it, here, here goes your blanks. This shows us a very powerful principle that the closer you get to Christ, the healer, the more you experience his healing power. Come on, the closer you get to Christ the healer, the more you experience his healing power. The further away you are from Christ the healer, the less you experience his healing power. So if we want to experience it, what do we want to do? We want to just help people draw close to Jesus. Amen. Proverbs 4.20 says this. It says, my son, pay attention to my word and be willing to learn. Isn't that interesting? Right, right. Be a, but pay attention to not what everybody else is telling you, but be attention to what my word says and be willing to learn from it. Amen? Because sometimes we've already made up in our mind what we believe, and we come to the Bible, but we're honestly not willing to learn. We're trying to get ammunition for our viewpoint, and we will overlook scriptures that would change our viewpoint, because we're not looking to learn, we're looking to get more ammo. Well, how ridiculous is that? How worldly is that? I'm not going to the Bible to figure out how to quarrel with you when the Bible tells me it doesn't want me quarreling with you. Hello? 
Come on, somebody. You need Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I'm going to go to the Word of God to figure out how to do what the Bible tells me not to do. Okay, then. good luck with that. No, come and don't try to get ammo. Just submit yourself. Just humble yourself. Just be willing to learn. Open your ears to what I say in my word. And do not let them escape from your sight, but keep them in the center of your heart. Just, just meditate on it. Just, 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 just be open to it. Just go on the journey with me. Let me take you on a journey. And then it goes on to tell us that if you would ever do it, that you find out that God's words are life to those that find them. But notice, you've got to find them. Because this world has hidden them. And Satan has hidden them. That's what the dark ages were all about. It's hiding the light that's in God's word that would change your life and your situation and your health and your healing and your family. Okay, he's trying to hide it. And so, and so since Satan has hidden it, we've got to be smart enough to search for it so we can find it. And if you would, then healing and health would come to all your flesh. So healing isn't just for your soul. It's not just for your soul. It's for your flesh, too. God wants to do some amazing things, not just spiritually and in your soul realm, but in your body as well. Amen? So Christ the healer, Luke chapter 6, verse 18 through 19 says this, they had come to hear Jesus. That actually is a very, very important part. You don't want to miss that. They came to hear Jesus and to be healed. In other words, they had to humble themselves to the understanding of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus, I come to listen. I've come to learn. And, and, and as you take me on this journey, see, the beautiful thing about Jesus is, is when Jesus took people on a journey, he began to cast out spirits and everybody was trying to touch him because healing power was coming out from him. And they all got cured, not just one or two. All of them got cured. Jesus didn't get 51% like we're getting today. He got 100%. But here's the deal. We're still trying to figure this thing out. Jesus didn't have to figure healing out. It was, he already knew it. He, he understood it. Which tells you this, that the more the church begins to understand it, the higher the percentages will become. But we've got so much misinformation that's clouding all this. And Jesus, he didn't have the misinformation. Some of his disciples did, but what was Jesus doing with his disciples? He was helping them come out from under the misinformation they learned. And when they did, they went out and were sent by him and blind eyes started to open and deaf ears started to come open and all types of stuff started to happen when they learned from Jesus. Amen. Here goes another verse, praise the Lord. Uh, Matthew, it says that Jesus withdrew from there and many followed him. Notice that they became followers of him. I, I, I'm going to let you take me on a journey. And those that went on the journey with Jesus, he actually healed them all. Wow. Wow. Now, once again, we're taking people on journeys and we're not seeing the same percentages Jesus saw. But we've got a lot of things we're trying to overcome. Jesus didn't need to overcome them. He knew exactly. He understood what the heart of God and what God wanted and how to accomplish it. And, and, and guys, the church today, we're still, we're still kind of questioning, is it even what God wants? Well, yeah, so our percentages aren't going to be as high as Jesus' percentages. But Jesus got them all healed when they began to follow him. And the more that we begin to understand and the more we begin to seek and the more that we begin to find, how many know the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus that lives in us will do to us what he did with his other disciples where he will reveal truth. He'll expose the lies. And before you know it, our percentages begin to rise too. Why? Because he is purifying us and sanctifying us from the misinformation through his word. Amen. The last verse that we look at is Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And it says, behold, this is Jesus talking. I have given you authority and power 
to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power that the enemy possesses. Who is the one that was going putting sickness on people? They were oppressed of the... Yeah, I, I give you power over all of it. All that oppression, all the sickness, all the disease, all the junk. And nothing will by any means harm you. So, so, so Jesus is saying, I don't want this healing ministry to die with me. I want it to be expanded through you. Amen. Because there are too many that are hurt. There are too many that are lost. There are too many that are dying. There are too many children that are losing their parents too early. And what if, just what if, what if, what if we opened up our eyes to just go on this journey with Jesus? What if we could help those kids keep their loved ones by introducing their parents to Christ, the healer? And you say, well, pastor, what if I pray for people and they, they don't get healed? Well, let me ask you a different question. What if we got 50% of them healed? Why does the church always focus on the people that we weren't able to help instead of focusing on the ones that we were able to help? And what if the more that we follow Jesus in this journey, what, what if our percentages kept getting higher and higher and higher? And we got to help more and more and more people. Escape the pain that comes from sickness and disease and the sorrow and the suffering that follows it. What if we only got 30% of who we prayed for healed? We changed 30% of the people we prayed. We changed their families forever. Wow. That's amazing. And I understand the pain of losing somebody because not everyone I've prayed for has been healed. I get it. But you know what God always reminds me of? How about the ones that got healed? Where would their life have been if you shut your mouth and never let me intervene in their life? Son, I know you're still learning. I'm still taking you on a journey. Amen? Amen? But think of all the people that have been able to be helped. And the more you let me teach you, the more you'll be able to help. Amen. Are you hearing me? So I just ask you, let me take you on this journey. Let me show you some of the things that the Lord has showed me throughout this up and coming month. And I want you to open up your hearts to it. Because there may be somebody that you know. It may be you. That man, if you would ever just open up your heart to go on this healing journey, you'd open up the door to some miraculous possibilities. Not just in your life and in your family, but in the life of those that you love, in your friends, in your co-workers and people that, that God is trying to reach. Is there a lot of confusion in the church still about this? Yes, there is. So is it okay for you to have questions? Yes, I want you to have them. I want you to have them. Give them to me. Email me them. Let me know. <laughs> because we're living in a generation that I believe God is trying to call the church up just a little bit higher where the things that he restored aren't segmented off in denomination here and this denomination here and this place got that and this place has this. I just think that he's wanting us to come together so that there's the fullness of Christ in one body and man you know what we got some people getting healed and we got some other people getting set free and we got some other people that are putting up fences for people amen and they're just working and helping and loving on each other amen and, and serving each other and blessing each other and, and see it all it becomes so beautiful when it's all put together and we're not fighting each other we're just surrendering to God's word and saying God just teach me just teach me. Father, I just ask that something I said today would spark something within someone's heart. 
that, Lord, for some, it would spark something that allows you to have access into their life so that throughout this next up and coming month, they can be healed by the power of God and they'll be able to experience you like never before. That, Father, they won't be able to say, well, I believe in Jesus. They'll say, I know that he's real. Amen. I, it's not a matter of believing. I know I've experienced his power. I've felt his presence. I've been healed by his touch. And it just takes their relationship with you to a whole other level. Father, for some, dear Lord, there's some things that are, there's giftings in them. There's things that you've called them to do. And I just ask that I, that, that this, the, the, the flame, I'll fan the flame that is in them in the area of healing. That they wouldn't let the coals and the ambers die out, but they would say, you know what? No, we're going to press into his presence. Hey, Amen. There's too much misinformation out here, but God, we want to, we want to pursue you so that, we, so that the ministry of Jesus isn't lost like what happened in, in times past. But that Father God, people begin to experience your touch. Families get to be changed forever. Children get to keep their parents because we're being obedient to our call. We give you the glory and the honor for it in Jesus' mighty name. The church said, amen and amen.